Thank you, brother. <clears throat> I'm going to start around the same place that Brother Bob did, because that's really the best way to understand the gospel is you've got to have the big picture first. And one of the first things that uh, believers should know is that we are not the center of everything God is doing. It's not all about me. It's not all about what I want or what I've done. It's about God's purpose. God is revealing himself in the gospel. He's showing things that otherwise would not be known, not even by the holy angels. So I'm going to start about the same place as Brother Bob. <clears throat> I found that uh, this text in Exodus 34 many times is a good place to begin, where the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That, by the way, this is the same God that just a few weeks before this had drowned the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Moses was not the first, and he certainly will not be the last, to make haste and bow his head at the revelation of God. <clears throat> the heavenly hosts are constantly praising and worshiping God as he continues to reveal more and more of himself to them. There are four beasts, and there are 24 elders before the throne, and the whole host of holy angels, and the scriptures tell us they sing new songs, and they ascribe praise and blessing to God because they have seen something new about God. In Revelation chapters 4, 5, 7, 11, 15, 18, and 19, there are these holy outbursts when in heaven because something new is seen of God. It is as if the heavenly personalities rejoice at the discovery that our God is even greater than we knew before this. He has more wisdom than we knew. His storehouse is bigger than we knew. We've never seen this part of him before. We didn't know that God could do this or that he was willing to do that. Especially now the holy angels who remember they saw a third of their brethren fall from heaven, never to be returned again, without a chance of recovery. Those who Satan took with him are destined for the pit like he is. Hell was prepared just for them, where there is no forgiveness, no salvation, no mercy, no repentance offered to any of them. Their eternal estate has already been sealed. Now this incident happened in heaven when Satan fell. This was not enough to reveal everything about God. His complete intolerance with the angels that fell revealed God's hatred for transgression against him. It revealed that he will by no means acquit the guilty. It revealed that God indeed is willing and able to condemn his own creation that transgresses against him. But that is not all there is to God. God has chosen to reveal more of himself, his mercy, his graciousness, his long-suffering, his abundant goodness and truth, his willingness to forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, his ability to do it in righteousness through Jesus Christ. In salvation, what the Father does through the Son and what the Son does for the Father presents the greatest and most glorious revelation of who our God is. Now that's the reason behind the theme of this year's renewal, <clears throat> what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. As we look more fully and more deeply into what Jesus has done, his accomplishments for us, we're going to see more about God. Things that perhaps we did, did not consider before or that no one had ever told us before. And this will build up our understanding. And ultimately, the declaration of these things redounds to the glory of God. So by the end of this renewal, you might find yourself saying, I had no idea God could do that. 
or no one ever told me that about God before. And we can say, I've been a believer and a student of the Holy Scriptures for years, but yet I have yet to discover the boundaries of the glories and the greatness of our God. So my text is one of those statements in Scripture that might sound like somewhat of a surprise, but it reveals something of God to us. In order for God to fulfill his purpose that he's determined before the foundation of the world, in order for him to reveal more of who he is to the heavenly principalities and powers, this had to be done. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus could be made a curse? How could God the Father do that to Jesus? If it were not for this being declared to us in the scriptures, who of us would have ever guessed that this is what happened? Which of us would have figured that when God said to Moses, I am merciful and gracious, that his mercy and grace extended to us would have been so abundant or that it would have reached so far and that it would have come at such great expense to himself and to his Christ. What Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, to what lengths did God go? Jesus was made a curse for us. Now there are things that humans have difficulty in believing about deity. Some have difficulty believing that Jesus could be both God and man, or that deity could become man, or that deity could suffer in any way, or that Jesus could be tempted, or that he could be made sin, much less that he could be made a curse. How is it possible that Jesus, who is the Lord's Christ, the word that was in the beginning with God and was God, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior, the only begotten Son of God, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Life, the one by whom and for whom all things were made, how could he be made a curse for us? My purpose this afternoon is to affirm that this is true and to expound how that it is true and that it is righteous. One of the things that God revealed in salvation <clears throat> is the price of sin and what it takes for him to forgive sin. In order to demonstrate that these things were necessary, in order to demonstrate these things, it was necessary for the persons in the Godhead to be separated from one another for a time. If there were no humility involved in forgiveness of sins, if there were no commandment involved, if there were no obedience involved, then there would be no need for the word to be made flesh. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now our sins, you know, this has been well established, that our sins had to be paid for. Saying, I'm sorry, is not nearly good enough to appease God. <clears throat> there must be payment, and it must be made to God. Payment's not made to us. Payment's not made to the devil. The payment's got to be made to God. <clears throat> God is the one we offended. God is righteous, and we were unrighteous. He is our maker. We are the created. Therefore, it is inescapable that the human race owes God a tremendous debt, and our race is answerable to God and will be judged of God, who is the judge of all. Since this debt and offense must be paid, now there's only two options for this payment to be made. <clears throat> and really, our race is so darkened by sin, we didn't even know about these two options unless God had revealed them to us in the Old Covenant. And these options, by the way, are God's choice. These are not options that we were presented with. God had these two options. Either every person in the human race could pay for their sins by God damning all of us. That's one option. That'd be payment, and it'd be just, and it'd be righteous. Or one man, one perfect and spotless man, one man who had no sin, one man who never offended God, could lay down his life for the entire race. Well, now, God, being merciful and gracious and long-suffering, 
and abundant in goodness and truth, and keeping mercy for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, we know which one of these options he chose. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And truthfully, this is the only way, because this is according to his eternal purpose. <clears throat> now, in preparation for this thing that Christ would do, there had to be a lot of preparation, you know. God established a covenant with ancient Israel involving an elaborate sacrificial system. In that system, a wonderful provision was revealed in which God showed that he could be satisfied and he could spare the lives of his people and forgive their sins, transgressions, and iniquities by recognizing the death of another, a substitute who had no sin, and the shed blood of another innocent of transgressions. However, as I said, this was an elaborate and precise system. In order for God to do this, these things had to be done his way. God's not going to pretend that sin has been put away. He's not going to pretend that it has been paid for. God is not going to pretend that he judged sin if he did not really do it. Speaking as a man, when it's all over with, if God doesn't feel good about it, you and I can't feel good about it either. So the payment had to be thorough and it had to be righteous. Brother Robert established that Jesus was made to be sin. Now, it's only, it naturally follows that if Jesus was made to be sin, then he also had to be made a curse. Jesus being made a curse was the result of him being made sin. Furthermore, it's absolutely essential that we understand that when the Holy Spirit says Jesus was made a curse for us, he means that Jesus was cursed of God, not that he was cursed of men, although he was, but that he was cursed of God. I emphasize that the purpose in salvation is for God to be satisfied and for God to be avenged and to be vindicated for our sin against him and for everything to be reconciled to God. Jesus did not come to please us and to make us happy. His death was not to make us feel good about everything. It was to please God, his Father, so that God could put the issue of sin to rest and to make God blessed. God revealed in the shadows, seen in the law of Moses, what was involved in saving sinners. <clears throat> First, I want to expound the concept of what a curse is. There are differences between being cursed and being made a curse. And there are differences between men cursing other men and God cursing men. Now, one of these can be ignored sometimes, but the other cannot. <clears throat> If another man curses you, often there's no need to give any heed to it. Matter of fact, Jesus said, bless them that curse you. Do good to them. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Among men, curses may not carry any weight. One man cursing another man could just be the expressions of contempt without any consequences on the one being cursed, other than perhaps your feelings get hurt or you're made angry. To curse when used as a verb, has to do with speaking or wishing evil upon another person. The word execration means to pronounce a curse, to utter, to express utter detestation. Another word is imprecation, which means, again, to invoke evil on another, or a prayer or a wish that calamity may fall on another. Yet another word that defines curse is malediction, meaning again to speak evil, to curse another. But unless supernatural powers, unless the spiritual world is involved in this, this is just talk among men. It carries no weight. <clears throat> it's wishful thinking. True, if someone were to curse us in this manner, it might hurt our feelings or make us angry, as I said, but men have no power to make their curses become a reality. Therefore, when Paul says Jesus was made a curse for us, he's not saying that this is what other men did to Jesus. Although that generation of Jews certainly cursed him, they viewed him as being a curse among men, but they did not make him a curse. That is not how our sins were taken away. But now when we consider God cursing, then we're speaking of something entirely different. Now it's not just talk and wishful thinking. When God says he's going to curse someone, we'd better listen up 
and pay attention and keep ourselves out of that category. When God curses, he has the power to injure, to subject to evil, to vex, to harass and torment with great calamities. When God curses, it is his sentence of divine vengeance on sinners and what he says he will do. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, the curse is not the law itself. <clears throat> if the law were a curse, God would not have promised to write it in our hearts and put it in our inward parts. <clears throat> the result of the law is that all who attempt to live by it are cursed, and they will die in God's displeasure. They will not succeed in pleasing God by keeping commandments. They will not have earned anything good from God by keeping of the law. That's because no man outside of Christ can keep the law perfectly. The end of the law is always a curse for every person who tries to live by it. But the law itself is just and holy and good. Christ did not redeem us from the law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The point now of the law we know has already been made, which is to show that we are sinful by nature. It was designed of God to expose our sinful nature inherited from Adam, and it has done that. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. If you've ever sinned, even just once, the whole issue has been settled already. You offended God. You've shown that you are capable of being evil. You've proven that you are not like God. You've broken his holy law, and by one single sin, you have brought upon yourself the wrath and judgment of God simply because you've shown you are not like him. <clears throat> this is the curse of the law. You don't get a second chance at this, by the way. One single sin proves everything that God already knew. All of Adam's race are sinners born into death. We were all actually destined to be cursed by the law before our mothers gave birth to us. This was inevitable unless God intervened. Can you imagine how repulsive it is for God for someone to neglect his great salvation and set out to please him by following a set of rules and commands <clears throat> with the intentions of finding life and righteousness in it? For as many are, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth. That's from the cradle to the grave. Continueth. In all things which are written in the book of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, in all things which are written in the book of the law. So here at the outset of the giving of the law, God already announced what would happen if his law was not obeyed. He announced through Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 11, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse, if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day. Now this perceived choice of blessing or cursing was set before the people, and it's set before all men, and yet the curse was still inevitable. Adam's race could not help but disobey and bring upon themselves the curse. God said, I set before you a blessing and a curse to demonstrate that man does not have a free will, he is by nature a slave to his own carnal passions and desires, and therefore he's a slave to the devil. And if this is not true, then we are capable of keeping the law <clears throat> flawlessly. Now, this per the particular curse of the law was spelled out specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I, I can't read all of this because the curse part of it is 40 verses long. <clears throat> in general... It says, you'll be cursed everywhere you go. Your land will be cursed. Your offspring will be cursed. Your crops will be cursed. Your livestock will be cursed. Cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly. You'll be cursed with sickness, disease, the sword, mildew. He'll hold back the rain. You'll be smitten by your enemies. You'll be smitten with mental illness. You'll be oppressed and spoiled. Another man will take your wife. You'll build a house and another man will take it. Your sons and daughters will be taken away to slavery and you'll live to long after them. 
I'll give you over to another nation that will make you worship gods of wood and stone. You'll become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations. God said, I'll bring in another nation that will lay siege to your city that will be so grievous you'll eat your own children. God said, if you won't serve me according to my covenant, then I'll make you serve your enemies, and they will not be merciful and gracious and long-suffering. Deuteronomy 28, 45, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded thee. <clears throat> now that's the curse of the law, and to tell you the truth, that's only about half of it. <clears throat> what I said here was just a brief summary. The curse is just as much a part of the law as the commandments are a part of the law. <clears throat> the curse was the manifestation of God's great displeasure with sin. The curse of the law guaranteed an extremely miserable existence without relief from anywhere. You would be cursed, everyone around you would be cursed, everything you owned would be cursed, everywhere you go would be cursed, there would be no relief and nothing to take pleasure in, in either life or in death. Now the magnitude of this curse of the law shows us at least two things. One, it shows how God feels about sin. And second, it reveals to us the great price of sin. When we say Christ was made to be a curse for us. I do want to specify here that the curses of Deuteronomy 28 <clears throat> were not for each individual sin, but for the failure of the nation to keep the covenant. When one person sinned, that did not cast the whole nation under this curse. Under the Mosaic law, there were provisions for individual sins <clears throat> and the Day of Atonement to deal with the sins of the nation in general. The Levitical priesthood was established by God to intercede for the people and to make sacrifices for their sins and to prevent this curse from coming on the nation. Under the same law that condemned all men for sin, God also made a provision to divert his wrath. In that sacrificial system, we see that God's wrath and displeasure for sin most certainly would be and must be satisfied, but that it was possible for it to be diverted to a substitute. <clears throat> Under the sacrificial system, the law of the law, lambs and bullocks and rams and goats and birds and heifers and calves were sacrificed for the sins of the people. All of these offerings had to be without blemish. They had to be killed at the door of the tabernacle or near the altar, in other words, in the sight of God. Their blood was sprinkled on the altar and poured out at the base of the altar. Certain sacrifices had their blood sprinkled on the veil. And on the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled in the most holy place itself, on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. There were different kinds of sacrifices and for different reasons. There was a peace offering, which is also called a free will offering. Now, this offering was not for sin. This was an offering of thanksgiving that the people could bring. When they perceived God had blessed them, and this offering could be, the meat of it could be eaten. It was shared between the person that brought it and the priest. They were to eat this. <clears throat> but that's because it had nothing to do with sin. The other sacrifices that had to do with sin could not be eaten. Sin offerings, trespass offerings, offerings for sin, for sins of ignorance, none of these were to be eaten. The bodies of those animals that were sacrificed for anything having to do with sin were consistently treated the same. They were slain before God, their blood was taken and sprinkled in the tabernacle, and their lifeless bodies were always burned, not baked as to be eaten, but burned to ashes, either on the altar or they were taken outside the camp and burned there. If the sacrifice was burned on the altar, the ashes later were taken outside the camp and dumped in the place designated for cursed things. And not only these things, but every person who handled these sacrifices had to wash before he was fit to come back into the camp with the rest of the people. This indicates that the animals themselves were the sin bearers and were cursed of God. If you even touch it, you wash before you come back into the camp. 
the animal sacrifices were not only the payment for sins, as if we're just making a train, uh, an exchange of something valuable, but the sins of the people were judicially transferred upon those animals. Those innocent animals took on the sins of the people so that God could judge sin and the people could live. Hence the treatment of them, their bodies being burned, taken outside the camp, and the scapegoat, remember, was taken away from the people and the requirement of washing before coming back into the camp. Now, if it were not for this sacrificial system, we wouldn't have near as much understanding, if any understanding, of what Jesus did on the cross. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit says Christ was made to be a curse for us, now we have a little better understanding of what happened and why. <clears throat> there are also some more details here that we need to speak about. First, when Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, he's not saying that Jesus was cursed with the curses in Deuteronomy 28. For one, Jesus kept the law perfectly. Therefore, for, for God to lay on him the curses of Deuteronomy 28 would not have been righteous. Furthermore, Jesus had no earthly possessions, no house, no field, no livestock, no wife, no children. The whole world was made by him and for him. All of his enemies were always in subjection to him. The, the demons trembled at the sight of him. So then we have to ask, how was Jesus cursed? The curse in Deuteronomy 28 and the curse that Jesus became are different in their details, but actually they're one in the same nature. Both the curse of the law and the curse that Christ became had to do with being forsaken by God. In Deuteronomy 28, it was obvious if you, were, if you fell under this curse, you were forsaken by God because everywhere you went, you were miserable. You were cursed in everything you touched. The only way for deity to be cursed is for deity to be forsaken by deity. Jesus was made to be a curse by God expressing his displeasure and forsaking him on the cross. I must confess, I feel like I only see very little of this. The fullness of this is incomprehensible for the, us at this time. For Jesus to be made sin and to be made a curse, I think, is one of the greatest and most profound mysteries of the gospel. And only by faith are we able to comprehend what we see. Jesus' prayers and supplications with strong crying out and tears, his being in agony, praying earnestly and sweating, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground, was at the anticipation of what he was going to become and what his father was going to do to him. Secondly, if we have a difficult time comprehending how God could make Jesus a curse, then again we look to the Levitical priesthood and the animal sacrifices. In the cross, God was not dealing with Jesus personally. He was not dealing with his only begotten son as he hung on the cross. He was dealing with our sin. In the law, when those animals were sacrificed, God didn't look down and see an innocent lamb or an innocent bullock. He saw the sins of the people. That's why they were to be burned and taken outside the camp. Those sacrifices bore the sins of the people, and God dealt with them appropriately. God did not consider Jesus on the cross he saw all the sins of the whole world and turned away his face from it. Jesus was the ultimate offering for sin. <clears throat> his blood was shed. His body bearing all our sins was removed. He wasn't, this didn't take place in the temple. This was outside the city, outside the gates, away from the people. <clears throat> he suffered being made a curse. In the grave, though, God saw Jesus his innocent son, and dealt with him in great mercy, but not on the cross. Jesus was made a curse in the sight of God, not necessarily to man. God was the one who had to be satisfied whether any man was satisfied or not. God had to be avenged for the sins of mankind in the cross of Christ. Sin had to be born in a body and paid for in the cross. All sin, all at one time, in one body, of one man, Jesus Christ, and he was made a curse for all of us. In the gospel now, another 
important detail is that there is a difference between committing sin and bearing sin. All of us have committed sin, but Jesus never committed sin. Jesus is not, was not a sinner, <clears throat> but he bore sin in his body on the tree. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Now this is a wonderful, merciful arrangement for us. It is not only the punishment for sin that was transferred to Jesus, but the sin itself was laid on him. How could it be otherwise? How could our sin be taken away if it wasn't laid on him? If it wasn't on him, then where did they go? Who bore them? Someone has to bear the sins, and whoever bears the sins must be judged of God. Sin itself was judged in Jesus. It was gathered and localized in one man at one time and judged by God once and for all and put away. Jesus was made to be a curse because he bore all our sins in his body. Furthermore, now God announced ahead of time about this cursing. Through Moses, he announced that he would curse, that his own Christ would become a curse. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. If a man have committed sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night up upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day for, and this is just a parenthetical phrase here, for he that is hanged is cursed of God, that thou shalt bury him that day that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. This is the only place in the Bible where this is stated. Just, and as I said, this is a, literally a parenthetical phrase here that Moses uttered. But this is what Paul hearkens back to, and he sees the significance of this in Christ and says that he was made a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. It's also important that we realize that Jesus, this does not mean that Jesus was cursed forever. Jesus was cursed while he was on the cross, but the curse did not extend to the grave. He was not forsaken in the grave. It's important to understand the details here of what happened. Jesus confirmed with his own mouth on the cross about the ninth hour. He cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But through the prophet Isaiah, God had already replied, for a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, just on the cross. But with everlasting kindness, I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. And David prophesied of the Savior's response. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoiceth, my flesh shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He was forsaken by God as he hung on the cross, but he was not forsaken in the grave because he had no sin of his own. There was a little wrath on the cross but hope in the grave. God hid himself from him on the cross, but showed him the path of life in the grave, out of the grave. Now the shadow of this is also seen in the ancient sacrificial system, in the fit man who took the scapegoat out into the wilderness, into the land not inhabited. After the sins of the people were confessed on the goat, the goat, innocent goat, bore the sins of those people. And the strong man, the fit man, the one appropriate for this, had to take the goat off into the wilderness. Now the fit man, in a sense, those sins were his. He had to bear them. He was responsible for the sins of the people as he carried that goat. But once he let that goat go, the fit man could turn and come back into the camp of the people because it wasn't his sin. 
he could come back. <clears throat> the sins did not belong to him. All he had to do was wash. And God shows us in these things how that Jesus took our sins away. Jesus had no sin of his own. It was our sins that were laid on him. He bore them in his body. He had to be physically removed from the city and from the people. He was cut off and made a curse of God while on the cross until those sins were carried as far as the east is from the west. But because he had no sins of his own, because he was only the bearer of sins, he was not forsaken in the grave, but God raised him from the dead. And back into the camp he came to make his report of his accomplishments. Now this is how Jesus could be cursed of God and yet be raised from the dead for our justification and ever live to intercede for us. This is how we can be buried with Christ in his death and be raised together to walk with him in newness of life. This is how death lost its sting. This is how the devil was destroyed. This is how he spoiled wicked principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. It was through the sinless one being made a curse for us. For us, that is in our stead, in our place, in our behalf, Jesus was made a curse in our behalf. He was made a curse in our interest. In other words, we did not have the capacity or the knowledge or even the desire to pay our debt for sin and appease God. So Jesus did it for us in order to please the Father. What has Jesus accomplished in our behalf? He was made a curse so that we would not be cursed. In this, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. The result of what Jesus accomplished on the cross is redemption. He rescued us from the curse of the law. Our vain investments only incurred a great debt to God, but Jesus bought out all our shares and was made a curse for us. He became our substitute. Now for those in Christ, <clears throat> if we are not under a curse, then surely we are blessed of God. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. Amen. 